It's nine o'clock. Uh, let's get started. Uh, my name is Richard Toll. I'm uh, one of the professors here uh, in Sussex <coughs> in the economic department. I changed uh, topic at the last minute, as some of you might have noticed. Um, I thought you, you guys would find this more interesting than what I initially had in mind, so talking about tourism. Um, and also this is a bit of an advertisement for uh, the course we're teaching in the spring term of the third year. And if, you, uh, if I whet your appetite for this topic, then uh, there's much more to come uh, next year. Uh, you do need to take environmental economics first before you can be admitted to climate economics. Um, so this is also a bit of an advertisement for uh, what we will be offering in the fall term uh, of next year. Um, <clears throat> I gave myself a slightly ambitious uh, title. Uh, I'm going to solve the climate problem, um, or at least propose a solution. First, going to describe uh, the problem a little bit, going to describe uh, the structure of the problem. Uh, as well as the structure of climate policy. Uh, I'm going to suggest a solution, but I'm also uh, going to be aware of the many things that stand in the way uh, of that uh, solution. So, anthropogenic climate change is mostly caused by uh, greenhouse gases. By definition, uh, greenhouse gases are transparent to visible light. That is, if solar energy in the visible spectrum uh, hits the atmosphere, uh, it passes through unhindered um, to reach us uh, who live at the surface of the planet. Um, and that energy get, uh, gets absorbed. Of course, the, uh, the planet has to be in an energy balance, so the energy gets uh, re emitted as well, not in visible uh, spectrum, obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be dark at night, uh, but it gets re emitted in the infrared spectrum. Um, <clears throat> And by definition, greenhouse gases are not just transparent to visible light, which means that you can't take pictures uh, of it, despite what you often see in the media. Um, greenhouse gases are not just transparent to visible light, uh, but they're also intransparent to infrared radiation. Uh, that is, if the infrared radiation hits uh, a greenhouse gas molecule, it gets excited. Um, of course, the molecules have to be in energy balance as well, so they get unexcited a little bit later, re-emit uh, the energy again in the infrared spectrum, uh, but in any direction rather than towards outer space as all the energy from uh, uh, the planet uh, goes. And that means that on balance, it is more difficult for energy to leave the system than to enter, which implies that in equilibrium, there's more energy stored on planet Earth because of the presence of greenhouse gases. And if there's more energy stored in a body, then it's warmer, by, uh, again, by definition. Uh, models show that without an atmosphere, planet Earth would be about 33 degrees Celsius cooler than it is now. The average uh, temperature of the planet is about 15 degrees. Um, Without an atmosphere, it would have been uh, minus 18 uh, on average, which is uh, probably not very suitable for uh, human life. Um, any life for that matter. That's a natural greenhouse gas, uh, the natural greenhouse effect. Um, <coughs> since the uh, start of the Industrial Revolution, and that's the small insets uh, to your left, um, the concentration of greenhouse gases has been increasing exponentially. What is shown here are the three most important anthropogenic ones, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, and nitrous oxide. And if you look at it at a longer time period, uh, that's the larger pictures, uh, that since the start of the uh, agricultural revolution about 10,000 years ago, uh, we see that that rise is quite spectacular for most uh, of human civilization. Um, these, the concentrations of these gases have been roughly constant, uh, but since the start of the Industrial Revolution, they have been going up. It has to do with population growth, has to do with the modernization uh, of agriculture, but it has mostly to do with the combustion of fossil fuels. Um, <clears throat> as I said, if there's greenhouse gases present in the atmosphere, then you would expect it to get warmer, and that is exactly uh, what we see. 
on your right hand side at the top we see the evolution of the global mean surface air temperature over the last 150 years which has gone up uh, not steadily but it has gone up um, if it gets warmer you would expect less snow and that is what you see uh, in the bottom graph that the snow cover uh, has been declining uh, and, and if the atmosphere gets warmer then the oceans must get warmer as well uh, because they need to be in an energy balance uh, with one another and if water expands it uh, if water warms, it expands, and that is also what we uh, see happening. Global uh, average sea level uh, has gone up. You may think that is a bit nuts. Um, your cup of tea does not visibly shrink uh, as it gets colder, uh, but it does, really, it only a little bit. And the same is true for the oceans. Uh, they have expanded by a little bit, but the oceans are on average three kilometers deep, so a slight expansion of a column uh, of three kilometers high is quite significant at a human scale, right? Most of us are small, uh, less than two meters tall. So a slight expansion of ocean waters is actually quite significant at a human scale, and that's what you uh, <laughs> see happening here. Um, <clears throat> there's no reason to assume um, that the past observed climate change uh, will stop uh, at any time. Um, in this picture you see uh, what might happen during the current century in black. Uh, you're looking at what happened during the previous century. Um, in uh, the colors uh, you look at what might happen uh, over uh, this century. Um, the uh, shaded areas that you see are a reflection of our imperfect understanding of the climate uh, system and how it would respond uh, to greenhouse gas uh, emissions. The alternative colors that you see are different ways in which the future might evolve, uh, uh, unfold with regard to population growth, economic growth, energy use, and so on and so forth. And the result is quite a bit of uncertainty. Um, by the end of uh, this century, probably by the end of your lifetime. Um, the planet may be warmer by one degree, if you're lucky, uh, and it may be warmer by uh, four, five, six degrees, uh, if you're not so lucky. Now you may ask, so what? Um, I like to go on holiday in Spain, where it's a good bit warmer than here, just because it's warmer there, because uh, I like uh, warmth. Um, <clears throat> it's a valid argument. Um, <clears throat> people have been studying the impacts of climate change uh, for quite a while now. Uh, there's positive impacts, there's negative impacts. Positive impacts include a reduction in winter heating, uh, a reduction uh, in cold related deaths. Uh, CO2 is a fertilizer to plants, uh, particularly beneficial to plants that uh, are growing uh, under drought conditions. Uh, so these are all benefits. Um, at the same time, uh, an increase in temperature would bring an increased demand for uh, air conditioning, would bring uh, more heat-related deaths during heat waves, uh, could mean the expansion of tropical diseases, would mean uh, sea level rise that endangers uh, coastal areas around the world. Um, <clears throat> it would uh, hurt plants, in particular ecological niche niches, as the niche moves away from uh, the plants, uh, then they might have nowhere to go, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a long list uh, of uh, impacts of climate change. Uh, one thing that may particularly hit uh, the southeast of England is that we expect it to get wetter in winter time. That means more, more winter floods. And at the same time, we would expect it to be drier in summer, uh, which would mean uh, extended uh, droughts, and both are actually quite uh, damaging uh, to the economy of uh, Southeast England. <clears throat> so what people have been doing is totting up uh, all these impacts, uh, trying to value them, trying to express them in terms of human welfare, uh, and here you're looking uh, at some of the results. There's a bit of a complicated graph. <clears throat> On the uh, horizontal axis, you're looking at scenarios of global warming expressed in degrees centigrade relative to pre-industrial times, that is 250 years ago. 
Um, <clears throat> and on the uh, vertical axis, you're looking at the welfare equivalent income chains. Uh, so the way to read this, that we focus on two and a half degrees, for which we have most evidence. Uh, then this reads that at two and a half degrees, global warming would make the average person on Earth feel as if she had lost 1.1% of her income. That is how you should read uh, these graphs. Um, now, two and a half degrees of warming is something that we might expect 2050, 2070, maybe 2100. So say half a century of climate change, maybe a century of climate change, whereas 1.1% of income is annual economic growth, roughly. Uh, so a century worth of climate change is about as bad as losing one year of economic growth. That's how to read uh, this graph. Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty, and there's even disagreement on the sign. Uh, as you see, some people say that a little bit of warming uh, is actually on net. Uh, good um, for human welfare. <coughs> um, there's quite a bit of uncertainty, as I said. Uh, negative surprises are actually more likely than positive surprises. And of course, as we move to further and further, more pronounced warming, then you would see that A, the negative effects start to dominate the positive ones, and B, uh, they, the negative effects get worse uh, and worse. But by and large, Climate change is a relatively small problem. Um, you will hear completely opposite stories in the media. For instance, uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, six months ago or so, gave an interview where she was asked the question, what keeps you up at night? And she said, I worry about climate change. Um, John Kerry, the uh, Secretary of State, uh, said very similar things. Um, you can sort of think Ban Ki-moon, the uh, Secretary General uh, of the United Nations, has also said that climate change is his top priority. You can interpret it as a genuine concern uh, of these people. You can also interpret it as Christine Lagarde actually has the Eurozone uh, to worry about and uh, structural imbalances between China and the USA. She's the head of the IMF after all. It's a sort of intractable problem, so maybe she's using this to actually distract attention from what she should be worrying about, what is actually her day job. Same goes for John Kerry, who's involved or should be involved in 10 violent conflicts that are protracted. So maybe he doesn't want to be blamed for his failures and says, I'm going to focus on something else instead. Little for Ban Ki-moon. Uh, so you should take uh, these pronounces, uh, these these, uh, <coughs> these pronouncements, with a bit of uh, uh, a grain of salt. Uh, occasion. The evidence that we have about the impacts of climate change is yes, it is a problem. It is certainly not the most uh, pressing problem uh, of humankind. The same is actually true uh, for. Um, emission reduction. So what do we need to do? Um, if we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, essentially two policies that are available to a democratic uh, environment, undemocratic environments, uh, may want to uh, reduce the number of people, that will definitely help. Uh, it's not necessarily an election winner. Um, you may also want to uh, shrink the economy uh, it's been shown to be a very successful way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by the former Soviet Union when it collapsed. Uh, its emissions uh, came down rapidly. It's also been very successfully shown uh, by the European Union uh, or the Eurozone uh, recently. If you sort of like want to mess around with your monetary policy and come up with an imperfect monetary union, that's a very good way uh, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But it doesn't make you very popular with the electorate because there's also a lot of economic misery uh, that, that comes with that. If uh, you want to maintain economic growth and uh, you want to uh, maintain or leave population choices to uh, uh, people rather than to government, <laughs> then you have two options to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. One is to use energy more efficiently 
that is get the same level of comfort, get the same level of uh, uh, services out of your engines, out of your machines, out of your lighting, out of your uh, power generators, uh, but with less energy input. Uh, or you could switch to alternative forms uh, of energy. So you could move away from coal, which emits a lot of CO2 towards gas, which emits much less. Of course, in Europe, we have been doing the exact opposite uh, in recent years. Or you could move away uh, to uh, even uh, more climate-friendly fuels, such as wind power, solar power, um, nuclear power, uh, and what have you. Problem with these things is that they are expensive. So electricity that is derived from coal comes at about four pence per kilowatt hour. Electricity that's derived from gas comes about at about six, cents, six pence per kilowatt hour. Wind is still around eight pence per kilowatt hour, so twice as expensive as uh, coal. You can, you can look at it in two ways. You can say, well, it's four pence per kilowatt hour difference What's that, right? You can also say it's twice as expensive. Uh, and then uh, you see the problem there, and that would, would imply doubling the electricity bill. If we were to go from coal to wind, then that would imply doubling the electricity bill um, for everybody. Uh, and of course, everything that derives from electricity, that is everything, that uses electricity would get more expensive as well. Um, you can also move towards um, one, one of the problems with wind is that it's not very popular. Uh, these wind turbines are visually intrusive. Uh, some of them are not very well built and they uh, fall down. Fortunately, they haven't uh, hit anybody yet. Uh, and they're also not very good for wildlife, particularly they chop up uh, birds uh, and bats. Um, if you don't like wind power, then perhaps you should go to solar power. Uh, but then you're talking about 10, maybe 12 cents, uh, pence per kilowatt hour. Um, it's feasible, but it's costly. Um, <clears throat> basic efficiency arguments would tell you that if you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then the cheapest way of doing so is by equating the marginal cost of emission reduction across the economy. Um, one way of establishing that is a uniform carbon tax. Um, that would guarantee static efficiency. Dynamic efficiency would have that the present marginal cost uh, is equal uh, over time, uh, which then implies that the marginal cost raise, rises uh, with the rate uh, of interest. These are just standard uh, efficiency uh, arguments. <clears throat> you can, of course, as a regulator, sort of say, well, I'm smart enough uh, that I know everybody's marginal abatement cost uh, curve, uh, and I'm going to use direct regulation to uh, reduce greenhouse gases. That is, I'm going to tell people what engine to put in their car. I'm going to tell people how much insulation they need in their house. I'm going to tell people. Um, what holidays to choose over their lifetime. I'm going to tell people uh, whether or not they should wear a sweater uh, in February. Um, that is uh, one way of regulating uh, emissions uh, and, uh, and environmental uh, externalities. It has been used a lot in the past. It has been very successful in cleaning up the environment in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s of the previous century essentially before you were born, but your, your parents may be able to tell you about how dirty the environment was back then uh, and what we did against it. That approach that the government goes in and tells people what to do, what not to do, how to do it, um, works very well if you have a few large sources of pollution. Then you can sort of imagine that the uh, regulator is informed well enough that they can come up with rules about how to behave uh, and what technology to use um, without causing too much damage to the economy. That is not at all the case for greenhouse gas emissions. Greenhouse gas emissions are something that follows from the behavior of everybody. 
and not just one aspect of our behavior, but every aspect of our behavior that uses energy. That is, if you load up uh, your smartphone, you use electricity. If you heat your house, uh, you use uh, energy. If you travel to the university, you use energy. And also, if you sit in a lecture hall, uh, then we're using electricity. So every aspect of our lives uses lots and lots of energy in very different ways. And we want to regulate all of that. And the best way to do that is really to leave those decisions to the seven and a half billion uh, consumers that are uh, on this planet uh, and use it through some sort of um, incentive-based regulation where the government gives you an incentive to reduce your emissions but doesn't prescribe how you should live your life, lead your life, right? So it's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, uh, but everybody's giving uh, a similar signal without being told uh, exactly what to do. <coughs> that is by far the cheapest way of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, unfortunately. And by far, I mean by an order of magnitude. Um, unfortunately, this method is not entirely, uh, it's not entirely penetrated uh, the minds of our dear leaders. Uh, Incentive-based regulation comes in different forms. You can use taxes, you can use subsidies, you can use tradable permits. Uh, tradable permits have gained a lot of political traction uh, in recent years, um, <clears throat> but they're not quite suitable for a problem uh, like climatic change, which is a stock uh, pollution rather than a flow pollution. Um, and there's theoretical arguments uh, that show that you better off with a system of carbon taxes than with a system of tradable permits. Um, <clears throat> the reason for that follows from the Weizmann theorem, 1974. Um, essentially, taxes, you know the price to the economy because you know the change in the marginal cost, but you don't know how people will respond, so you have uncertainty about the amount of emissions that come out after taxation. Uh, whereas with tradable permits, you have a total cap on emissions, so you, there's no environmental uncertainty. You know how much emissions uh, there will be. You disregard illegal emissions for the moment, but you've placed a cap on it, and you don't really know. You can't predict what the price will be. So there's uncertainty about the economic cost with tradable permits, but no uncertainty about the environmental consequences. Whereas with taxation, it's the other way around. You have cost certainty, but environmental uncertainty. Now with a stock problem, and definitely with a global stock problem, environmental uncertainty is not that costly. <clears throat> because climate change is driven by emissions from all over the world and over a century. So if the UK gets hit wrong in 2015 or 2016, that is no big deal. Because what matters is the sum total of all emissions of all countries over an entire century. So making a mistake in one small jurisdiction in one year doesn't affect the climate. So cost uncertainty is, or environmental uncertainty is essentially irrelevant. Whereas if you have a carbon price that is too high, or screwing your economy, you're driving up the bills uh, for energy for all your households, you're losing competitiveness in, in the global market, uh, and so on and so forth. Cost uncertainty is a big deal. Environmental uncertainty is not with a global stock problem. And therefore, you should move to a system um, of carbon taxes rather than tradable permits. Again, a message that has been <coughs> somewhat lost on our dear leaders. If you regulate greenhouse gas emissions at the lowest possible cost, then again we find a trivial problem. What you're looking at here uh, is the loss in income in the year 2100. And that's given on the uh, vertical axis. Uh, as a function of the stringency of climate policy, and that is given on the horizontal axis. I won't have time uh, to get into where these numbers come from. Uh, there's obviously uncertainty and there's disagreement, 
uh, between models. <clears throat> but if you just look at the scale of the, uh, the vertical axis, what we see is that if you're sort of like very pessimistic and you believe the worst model that is out there or the most pessimistic model that is out there, not necessarily the worst in quality, then you would see that by the end of the century, in the year 2100, if you go for a very stringent climate policy, then by the end of the century we will be perhaps 13% poorer than we otherwise would have been. 13% over a century. That's nothing, right? If, I mean, if the economy grows uh, at 2%, then it doubles every 35 years. So this essentially means that the, the wealth that we would have reached in the year 2100, we will now see in the year 2105, if we're very unlucky. But more likely, the wealth, the level of income that we would have reached on the 1st of January 2100, we will now reach on the 1st of March 2100. This essentially disappears into the noise. So I've now said two things that might strike you, for those of you who read newspapers and watch telly, um, as weird, right? On the one hand, I've said that climate change is not a very big problem. And on the other end, I have said that the solutions to climate change, climate policy, is not very complicated either. Now, if you follow the debate in the media over the last year or the last two years or the last uh, 20 years as I have, then you would see a lot of noise. Whereas if you look objectively at the problem, the problem isn't very big, the solution isn't very big, why don't we just do it? Um, but there is a lot of noise uh, in, out there, and there's actually uh, a lot of noise out there for uh, good <coughs> reasons. And I'll, I'll take you through some of the political economy uh, of climate policy. Um, throughout history, the history of the Germanic people, which include the Anglo-Saxons, um, there has always been Ragnarök, there's always been Armageddon around the corner. There seems to be an intrinsic demand in our culture that the world is going to end unless we atone for our sins. That has been a constant fact of culture, uh, at least in Western Europe. Um, <clears throat> Now, the church has largely moved out of our lives, um, so we don't no longer believe in sins, we no longer believe in Armageddon, um, but there's still this moral vacuum is there from how to live our lives, and uh, most of us would prefer to be guided uh, rather than make our own decisions and follow uh, some sort of guru who would tell us uh, how to do so. The environmental movement has moved into uh, the gap that was left by uh, the church withdrawing, not for everybody, obviously, uh, but for a, a significant number of people, the church, uh, the, the environmental movement has taken over um, this particular role uh, to guide uh, us in our behavior and the decisions uh, that we make and how we uh, judge people to be uh, good or bad and how we see ourselves. Um, They've jumped into this uh, gap in the market. They've proclaimed that climate change is a new Armageddon. A lot of people believe them and happily pay uh, contributions towards Greenpeace and WWF and Friends of the Earth and all those uh, organizations, uh, which, of course, is in their self-interest. I mean, these are member ba membership-based organizations. That's where they get most of their money and most of their power from, and they need to give people what they want and apparently what a lot of people want is to be told that the world is going to end unless. Um, so that is one of the uh, reasons out there why climate change is so 
uh, exaggerated. It's simply in the self-interest of the environmental movement uh, to uh, tell this story, to exaggerate. Um, and there's a lot of people who simply like to believe that the world is going to end soon. Um, climate policy is also a godsend to politicians. Um, climate policy is a global problem, or climate change is a global problem. It's, an inter uh, it's a long-term problem. So climate policy allows politicians to claim that they are saving the world. This is, of course, something that a lot of politicians like to do. They tend to be alpha males or alpha females, and they tend to have a sense of grandeur about themselves. Um, and they tend to have a sense of self-importance uh, about themselves. And if you don't have that, then you won't survive in politics. Right? Um, <clears throat> so climate policy allows politicians to promise to go save the world. What better legacy is there? right? Uh, at the same time, because it is a long-term problem, most of the heavy lifting of climate policy, most of the raising of energy bills, uh, battling lobby groups, and so on and so forth, will be done by your successor. If you look at the pronouncements about climate policy throughout the history, the 20-year history of climate policy, most of these things are promises that will only be fulfilled after the next election or the election after next. Which means that essentially what they're promising to do is not something that they will do, but their successors will do. So they are saving the world, whereas the successor, which is likely to be an opposition politician, will inflict the pain. It's a wonderful uh, policy for uh, politicians. And if all of a sudden, by uh, some uh, miracle, they are forced to do something now, they can always hide behind the Chinese who don't want to act, or the Americans who don't want to act, or the Poles who don't want to act. So there's always an excuse not to do much. while continuing to promise to save the world. Um, the climate policy that we've seen um, is often about creating rents rather than reducing emissions. It's about rewarding political allies uh, rather uh, than reducing emissions. Climate policy has not been sort of the first best world that I suggested that we just have a uniform carbon tax uh, and that's it. No, it's a plethora of technical mandates, of subsidies, of um, market distortions, and so on and so forth, that if you look at it closely, typically create a rent for somebody um, out there. Uh, and these rents are often uh, used to reward political allies. Not always. Um, this is uh, Li uh, Heijun, uh, who is, since last week, uh, China's richest man. He is in solar energy. Very little solar energy has been sold ever without subsidies. This man is the richest man in China because of subsidies in the US, because of subsidies in Western Europe, because of subsidies in Japan. This man grew rich on our tax money. And he grew very, very rich. So it's not necessarily the case that um, these rents go to the allies of our politicians. They sometimes uh, mess up and give the rents to somebody else. Um, climate policy is also a godsend for bureaucrats. There's a new policy, and that means that we need a new bureaucracy. And uh, if you take uh, the theory of bureaucracies and what they do, then really what bureaucrats want to do is they want to maximize their office. They want to maximize their desk and the number of people that work for them. Um, <clears throat> so what has um, international climate policy done in particular, uh, focus on the uh, red uh, triangles, 
Uh, this is the cost of the international climate negotiations from the start of the international climate negotiations proper uh, in 1995. So at the first conference of the party, there were 2,000 people. What you say is a lot to talk about uh, a problem, but then again, they represent uh, 200 countries, so it's about 10 pe people, persons per country. That's not uh, too much. Um, in, back in 1995, there were <coughs> two meetings about international climate policy. If we go forward in time to the year 2012, there were three meetings on international climate policy per week. Copenhagen, the international climate negotiations there were attended by 40,000 people. The organizers of the Lima Conference of the Party in December last year claim that there were 100,000 people involved. Mind you, they, they, these, all these people didn't do much in terms of reducing emissions. Emissions have just been going up. And the, but the cost of, these, uh, of the International Climate Circus has risen uh, <coughs> quite substantially from a negligible a uh, few million per year uh, to over 120 million dollars per year nowadays and this is just the international climate part. Now as I said these international climate negotiations have not succeeded in reducing uh, emissions but these people don't go there for nothing. What they do is they create paper, they create hot air, they create agreements and these agreements are being taken back to national uh, bureaucracies and say there is a, a new deal, there's new un, uh, uh, obligations under um, uh, international climate policy, there's new complicated treaties to be uh, studied, so that means that we need to hire more consultants, that needs, means that we need to hire more lawyers to actually look at what do these treaties really mean, um, and there's also new reporting obligations and, and so on and so forth, which means that we need to hire new civil servants to write these new mandatory reports for the International Climate Service. So what we have seen over the last 20 years of international climate policy is that emissions have continued to go up by a few percent per year, but the bureaucracy that is supposed to control the climate problem has been growing exponentially at a much, much faster rate than uh, a few percent per year and has essentially been ballooning. And that is exactly what uh, bureaucracy theory uh, would tell you. Confronted with a new problem, we create more bureaucracy and uh, new problems uh, are very uh, attractive in that sense. And that's what climate policy has been about, it's about uh, creating new uh, policy. <clears throat> at the same time, all this new bureaucracy, people who don't like government much, see this as definitely in the US you will hear people say that climate policy or climate change is just a hoax uh, that was created by the United Nations to install a world government. I don't think that is remotely true, I don't think that climate change is a hoax. Uh, and I don't think uh, the United Nations is bent on taking over the world, uh, but just if you look at the size of the climate bureaucracy, you can sort of uh, you can sort of understand that people come away with the impression that that is indeed what climate policy is about. Um, it's about extending uh, powers. So climate policy has also been used as a power grab by the uh, European Union. Environmental policy in the European Union is majority based. That is majority voting and then uh, environmental policy is, uh, becomes law in Europe. Uh, whereas industrial policy, national governments still have a veto right. But because climate policy is now so intrusive, it's overtaking energy policy and therefore member states are losing their vetoes. It's taking over transport policy, where member states are losing their vetoes. It's taking over industrial policy, it's taking over agricultural policy. So climate policy has been used by the European Commission and by the European Council 
to extend its powers over the member states. So for people who don't like the European Union much, it follows that they should also dislike climate policy. And one way of expressing your dislike successfully about climate policy is to say climate change is a hoax. So there's a lot of politically motivated, sometimes blatant, more often um, sometimes even uh, subconsciously, because this power grab of the United Nations, this power grab of the European Union is inspired by climate science, by climate change, there are political reasons to attack uh, the climate science that is used to justify all this. So there's no surprise that the right wing uh, of the Republican Party in the US is dead against climate change, right? And they say it's not true. It's no surprise uh, that UKIP has a very anti-climate science stance because climate science and the European Union go hand in hand. Um, there's of course also just structural economic problems uh, why this is hard to solve. Greenhouse gas emission reduction is a global good. If you reduce your emissions, you will suffer the consequences of reducing those emissions, whereas the avoided climate change, the benefits of reduced climate change fall on everybody over a long period of time. So it's a classic public goods uh, problem, and those things are just uh, very hard to solve. Rational self as actors. Uh, always have an incentive to free ride on the efforts, uh, efforts of others. There's no solution to this. This is the structure of the problem. The only real solution to this part of the problem is to install a world government, uh, which is not something uh, that I would be a big fan of. Other people uh, are. Um, I like democracy. Uh, if you were to have a world government and the world government, that world government would be democratic and chances are that the president of the world would not look like uh, David Cameron or Ed Miliband, whoever is your favorite. Maybe 45 million people in this country, right? The Indians have a billion voters. The Chinese have a billion voters. So if we were to have a world government that was democratic, then the president of the world would look like Modi or he not like Cameron or Miliband. And I, for one, uh, am happy that I live in the UK uh, and not in India or China. Um, does not mean that uh, there is no solution uh, to uh, the climate problem. <coughs> for the last 20 years or so, uh, there have been surveys about what does the electorate think about climate change and should we be doing something about it and these surveys have been done across the world and they consistently find the picture as you show here there is overwhelming support in the electorate that we should be doing something to solve this problem and also if you ask more sophisticated questions not just should we solve the problem assuming that the solution is costless also if you ask more sophisticated questions like should we shift taxation, the burden of taxation away from labor and capital towards energy, then the answer is yes. And what you're looking at here is a poll uh, that was done just before the um, last U.S. elections. Would you vote for a, ca a candidate for the presidential election who supports legislation to reduce the federal income tax but increase taxes on fossil fuels? The answer is yes. And the answer is independent of whether the people were Democrats or Republicans. People recognize that climate change is a problem and we should be doing something about it. So there is political support uh, or electoral support uh, for this. Um, one thing to realize uh, is that the cost of emission reduction vary widely between companies, between sectors, between countries over time. Um, but we already have actually the uh, tools, the instruments to allocate 
emission reduction effort where it is cheapest. Um, taxation would be one form, trailable permits would be a slightly less preferred uh, form, but still better than uh, a lot of its alternatives. Um, all those things are already in place. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol negotiated in 1997 in the city of Kyoto, as you may have guessed, under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Most, most of the, the attention to the Kyoto Protocol has been about the emission reduction targets that it set and that have now expired. They expired on the, 20, uh, the 31st of Je uh, December uh, 2012. Uh, those things have now expired. A lot of people have forgotten about the Kyoto Protocol. But it also does establish tools through which a country that is very keen on reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but in which it may be very expensive to do so, it has given that country the tools to invest in emission reduction elsewhere where it may be cheaper, but where the government may not be so keen, uh, or the population may not be so keen. Uh, so that uh, is already in place, and that uh, can be continued uh, to use to keep the cost of emission reduction low. Um, <coughs> the uh, most important uh, part, I think, uh, of climate policy uh, follows from this picture here, uh, which uh, tends to be complicated. Uh, or tends to confuse people. What you're looking at um, on the uh, vertical axis are different types of fossil fuels. Uh, the top two are gaseous, shale, and natural gas. Uh, then we have four types of liquids, extra heavy oil to crude, and then we have three types of solids, lignite uh, to bitum uh, bituminous. Um, so these are the fossil, fuel, uh, fossil fuels that we have. Uh, then the colors denote what are these, right? This is stuff that is still in the ground. In black, we're looking at the reserves, those fossil fuels that we know we can get out of the ground at current prices, profitably with current technologies. And then there's the resources, and they come in gradations, proof, probable, possible, that stuff that we think we might get out of the ground in the future if technology progresses, or stuff that we think that is out there, but we're not quite sure because we haven't really uh, bothered looking. Um, um, so this is the Im amount of fossil fuels uh, that we have. On the uh, horizontal axis, you're looking at what would happen to the atmosphere if we would get all of this stuff out of the ground in one go and burn it in uh, an hour or so. It's physically impossible. We're not going to do that, but it's a hypothetical scenario. It will tell you the relationship between the climate problem and our uh, fossil fuel uh, resource problem. Uh, the units here are parts per million by volume. The political debate is really about should we go for 450 ppm in the end of 550 or 650 and you see immediately uh, that those are the numbers we're looking at here as well. If we were to say we go for the two degrees target of the United Nations and the European Union then we can emit perhaps another hundred uh, parts per million um, of uh, CO2. Uh, if you now look at this graph, you see if you add natural gas to crude oil, then you're at about 100 parts uh, per million. Which implies two things. One, that we can burn all the conventional oil and gas that we want without causing a substantial climate change problem. And it also implies and that's the different way of saying the same thing, that conventional oil and gas are not the problem with climate change. So everybody's protesting ExxonMobil or BP or uh, Shell, they're actually not the problem. It's not the Russians and the Qataris and the Saudis uh, that are doing this. No, essentially what will happen is that we are running out of conventional oil and gas. And we can burn it all without causing a substantial climate problem. The climate problem in the long run is not driven by conventional oil and gas. It is by what will replace conventional oil and gas once it's all gone. That is the climate problem. Now, if we're running out of conventional oil and gas, that means that we need a different source of uh, energy. Conventional oil and gas are the mainstays of the global economy, of the global energy system. Uh, and there is a revolution going underway in 
energy anyway, because people are beginning to realize that the stuff is running dry. And there's a lot of investment in new sources of energy. There's a lot of uh, investment in R&D. There's new companies emerging that are challenging the incumbents. There's new countries emerging in uh, the geopolitics of energy. Uh, the US is taking over uh, Saudi Arabia again in oil production. Climate policy, if we really want to completely decarbonize the economy, as we probably should to uh, uh, control the climate problem, also needs a revolution in energy. We need new countries that supply energy, we need new companies uh, that supply energy, we need a, a lot of investment in R&D and we need to build up a lot of infrastructure. At the moment, those two, one real revolution that is driven by the market is continuing apace. Uh, the other, the desired revolution in climate policy is going on on its own steam and the two are completely disconnected. And what climate policy should be doing is not try to invoke an energy revolution but it should instead write on the energy revolution that is going on uh, already, which means stop antagonizing uh, the people who are actually uh, driving this. Um, and that uh, may be uh, the way uh, forward. So, to wrap up, climate change is the smallest problem with a small solution. Um, that's if you look at it objectively. Uh, if you look at it through the eyes of political economy, then you would see is that there's forces uh, that conspire to complicate the solution and polarize the debate. Um, <coughs> there is a revolution going on in energy uh, anyway. We might as well write uh, that wave in climate policy. And perhaps there is some hope uh, that austerity is killing uh, subsidies and is creating a need for uh, carbon taxes. Um, and additional government revenue across the world, not just in Europe, uh, and, and hopefully something else will scare uh, the dimwits uh, in the environmental movement and take their eye off climate policy so that we can actually move, uh, get a move on and come up with a rational policy. That's all I wanted to say. I hope to see you again next year. <laughs>